How many understand this morning it's easier for children to memorize things than it is for adults? How many know that to be true? Children can see something and just, just remember it and they can recite it. Uh, but as we get older, it gets more and more uh, difficult to do. Uh, isn't that true? They've actually found a reason for that, and not just because our minds are old and tired and full, but actually, uh, compared to adults, children have more nerve cells that can actively create new connections so they can learn more quickly. They learn languages more quickly. Funny story, when my brother Jim was thinking about going onto the mission field about 20 years ago or so, um, they have to take uh, aptitude tests, and one of the aptitude tests was the ability to learn a new language. And so it was his turn to be interviewed. They said, Brother Sabella, you're going to work hard at learning the language, aren't you? And he said, yes, I'm going to work hard. And they said, you're going to need to because your aptitude for this is not so, not so great. Uh, his wife did really well. His children were young. But my brother did well, too. I'm just teasing about, about that. But uh, children have uh, more active brain cells. This is why they can learn new languages, learn to play an instrument, or pick up a new sport more easily than adults can. Again, I just tell people I can't remember. My mind is just full. That's all. I have a lot going on uh, up, up there. I wish that were the case. Now, the early church we talked about last week or the week before, I don't remember, uh, the early church obviously didn't have a Bible for every person. Now, we pretty much have a Bible for every person or we have it on our phone, our tablet, whatever the case might be. But before the printing press, most people were illiterate. Most people had no access to the Word of God for 1,400 years. Only wealthy people or the large churches had had the scriptures and it would be read to them. And so they had to memorize portions of scripture in order to know scripture. They didn't have textbooks written. They didn't have uh, their, their doctrines necessarily written out. They had to memorize everything. And so the early church wanted to establish something, early by a couple hundred years old, wanted to establish something that would bind together all believers in Jesus Christ, all true Christians, and so they came up with a statement called a creed. Now, in our circles, we don't use creeds too much, and yet the Apostles' Creed is so important and so powerful uh, for us. This is how the early church was able to know the doctrines of God, and they would, they would memorize it. And so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the Apostles' Creed. I'll just walk through this very quickly uh, today. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That's what I spoke on the last time. And then today's is, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. We're going to talk about why that's so important. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Six, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Seven, the Holy Catholic Church. That doesn't mean Roman Catholic. That means Catholic meaning universal. We've talked about this. There's an invisible church made up of all believers, billions of people. Then there's the visible church, which would be us, a local. Catholic in this term doesn't mean Roman Catholic. It means the universal church of which all believers are a part of. The Holy Catholic Church, meaning the importance of the church, the communion of the saints, the fellowship, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life ever everlasting. Now, I want to do something. Uh, I broke it down into like college. College age and under. So we'll go maybe 24 and under. Anyone that can memorize the Apostles' Creed uh, will get a free, a free lunch. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a guy that gets it, uh, Pastor Rick or myself will take them to lunch. If it's a, a girl, then Kelly will take them uh, to lunch. Okay, And then also anyone 24 and over will also get a lunch and, and the, the same sort of thing. So we're going to have a couple winners, and if we have a few people to do it, we'll treat everyone to lunch. Everyone to lunch, if you can memorize the Apostles' Creed uh, in that, okay? So you can work on that and let us know, and Kelly will be the, the judge of it. Um, she'll decide whether you have it memorized or, or not, but that'll include a free lunch, and uh, it'll be a good lunch. We're, we're looking. Have you been to... Uh, this is an advertisement. Sorry, I'm going to get into it in a second. Have you been to the Outlaw Burger Barn in Vineland? Can, can somebody say glory to God with me? Glory to God. How many have not been to the Burger Barn yet? 
do you like hamburgers, first of all? Like if you're like just pretty much a grass and tree bark person, you, you might not like it. But how many like hamburgers? Okay, good. You have to go to this place. It is that good. They get their meat fresh from Main Road Meat Market, and uh, part of their, their money goes to missions. I mean, how can you not support that? And they play worship music as you're eating there, but they only seat a few people. All right, so you got to get there. Anyway, a free lunch, whether it's there or somewhere else. So, you, you know, you can tell Kelly afterwards. Yeah, afterwards. But you work on that. It's just something fun. And we'll, 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 we'll introduce you and you won't have to do it in front of the whole church because I know that's a lot of pressure to be, able to, to be able to do that. If you want to do it in front of the whole church, we'll include dessert. How about that? That will include dessert in it. So you work on that 24 and under, college age, whatever that might be, and, and over and over. And uh, for those that are over uh, 50, uh, you can use a couple notes, just a couple notes in, in your hand, okay? Uh, so uh, anyway, so that's the Apostles' Creed. This is what believers, those that call themselves Christians, would, would believe. These are the main doctrines. Within that are little sub-settings and things. That's where we get denominations from. But all true believers in Jesus Christ would believe these things. They memorized it. The early church uh, used it as a statement of faith. They used it to train and to teach. They used it as preaching points, which is what we're doing throughout the summer. It provided a strong foundation and doctrinal basis for churches to accept one another, but also to keep out false teaching. If someone didn't believe that in the virgin birth, let's say, well, that would be outside of the kingdom of God. And I'm going to explain today why the virgin birth is so important. But today, our focus is going to be on this statement. And uh, let's go to that next slide. And let's say it uh, each point, okay? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. This is such an essential part of what we believe. Now, today I'm passionate about this. It, sometimes my passion comes off as anger, but I'm actually not angry at all. But I am passionate about this because what I'm going to talk about today makes all the difference between an eternity with God and an eternity outside of God. That's why it's so essential, and that's why it's so important that everything that we do as a church, our very existence, is based on what I'm going to share with you today. That's why we even have church. That's why we uh, support missions. That's why we get to all of it is based in this message and in this word today. Now, for my sermons, for the most part, I break all of my sermons down. I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but this is just a general thing that, that I do, is I break it down into what, so what, and now what. So each sermon has a text. That's the what. And then we try to explain that text. The so what is, okay, who cares? Okay, uh, why is it important to us? And then the third part is now what? Okay, now that we have this, now what is the application to that? So if you ever followed along or you kept notes, that's the basic of every, almost every week uh, in how I do it. What, so what, and now what? So let's start with our texts for today. And I have them up on the screen. I'm going to read a lot of scripture and break it down uh, for, you, for you today. This one is famous, obviously. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. When Jesus came the first time, it was not the time of judgment. It was the time of sacrifice and paying for our sins. When he comes back again, that's going to be the time of judgment. How tremendous was that song that Dave wrote? How perfect was it? I'm sitting there going, he didn't even know what I was preaching. And like he just preached the whole sermon. Uh, I should not even preach. No, that never crossed my mind. But yeah, how perfect it was and how it fit. When he comes, we've got to be ready. We've got to be holy. <laughs> we've got to be living for him. Okay? So then verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but, to, but whoever does not believe stands what? Condemned, condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only 
son. So the question arises often in religious circles, but even more importantly by the critics of Christianity, what about those that have never heard? Is it right for God to send someone to hell if they've never heard about Jesus? Have you ever heard that question or even wondered about it yourself or as a family member challenged you with that belief? David Platt says this, we base this question toward or we bias this question toward ourselves and away from the holiness of God. Okay, now watch what he goes on to say. At every turn, we as humans look for opportunities to point to the injustice of God. Isn't that really the basis of that question? What about those that don't believe? You know what a better question is? Do you believe? And do you trust God that he's holy and that he's right and the decisions he makes are right? Isn't it interesting that we as humans, we want to do whatever we want to do, and we don't want anyone to cast judgment upon ourselves, but when almighty, holy, perfect God makes a decision, we want to judge him. And so how does this all play out in the end? I don't know. But I do know that whatever God decides is right, and whatever God decides is just, and whatever happens is the right thing for it to happen. And when we get to heaven, we'll see that God was right all along and that we were wrong most of the time. So this question is not so much based on anything other than we want to judge God. And so we come up with these exceptions about, well, what about this person and what about that person? When scripture says those that believe are not condemned, those that don't believe are condemned. I mean, this is it right here. This is not the word of Randy Sabella. You should not take the word of Randy Sabella, but you must take the word of God that has been established, and we've talked about this over and over and over again. Let me show you another passage in Romans 1, 19 and 20. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. How has God made it plain to them? Through general revelation, the heavens declare the glory of God. Yes? Okay? He created the stars. He named all the stars. We look to heaven and we see a designer. What on earth or what in the universe doesn't have a design? Everything has a design. Everything has a design because everything has a designer. But when it comes to the universe, those that don't want to believe, those that want to reject God for who he is, they come with, up with every reason and every excuse that the universe came from nothing. Well, what comes from nothing? Nothing, okay? Even now, science believes in the Big Bang Theory, and what that means in the Big Bang Theory is that the universe even began at some point. So the universe is no longer eternal. Even atheistic, materialist, evolutionists don't believe in the eternalness of the universe. They believe that the universe had a beginning point, and then to us that believe in our hearts, what does that say? Of course there's a beginning point because everything that has been designed has a designer. Everything that we see has a beginning, even the universe. And so who created the universe? Well, it had to be someone outside the universe. It had to be someone all-powerful. It had to be someone personal that had a will and could make choices. We would call that first cause God. God. Even the heavens declare the glory of God. And so what has been known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. That's just general revelation. Special revelation is the Bible. That it was written by 40 so different people over 1,600 years. It has a common theme that it's all about Jesus and God's redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. There are no, um, uh, 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 what do you call, discrepancies or disagreements in scripture that can't be easily explained by anyone that has a, a first level uh, degree of college education. Yeah, you can ask someone on the, you know, out in the neighborhood and they might not have all of the answers and they say, oh, yeah, you see those Christians, they don't even know what they believe. Well, why don't you ask someone that does know something? I mean, if you're going to justify your whole lifestyle and you're going to risk eternity in hell, shouldn't you at least ask questions of somebody that might know the answer? Instead of going by your neighbor that hasn't been in church in three years but calls themselves a Christian? 
I mean, isn't it worth taking the time and evaluating and asking some questions? Isn't it worth stopping, looking at other believers and saying, well, I could never be a Christian because they call themselves a Christian. Okay, is that really worth your eternity? Is it worth looking at the truth? Is it worth looking at someone and hearing someone that actually knows some answers to these bigger questions? We're not saying don't ask the questions. We're saying go to somebody that knows. Well, I want to learn to play baseball, so I went to the football coach. I wanted my car fixed, so I took it to the doctor. My elbow hurts, so I went to the mechanic. I mean, we don't do this in any other area except belief. And I use religion in, in this in a positive way in that regard. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm going to bring this around because we're probably mostly believers here today. I'm going to bring this around in a, in a little bit. For since the creation of the world, hello? Hello? Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, I just said this, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood from what has been made so that men are without, men are without what? Okay. Men are without excuse. Let's go on to the next one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now that word all in the Greek, means all. It means everyone, okay? Everyone has sinned and falls short of the perfection, the majesty, the glory, the weightiness, the power, the magnificence. Everyone has sinned and falls short of who God is. Now, if you're going to compare yourself to your neighbor, then you might be above your neighbor, but the comparison is not to your neighbor. The comparison is not even to the per sitting, person sitting next to you in church. The comparison is not to the pastor. The comparison is to Jesus himself. That's how we all fall short. If you watch TV and see these crazy uh, Hollywood people, you might say, well, I'm a good person compared to them. Well, you might be compared to them, but compared to Jesus, we're not. And all men, all men fall short of the glory of God and, but here's the good news, and are justified by his what? Grace. Through the redemption that came by who? See, there is no other name by which man shall be saved. That's the good news. I was listening to a sermon this week and I was uh, convicted because I've always known and memorized for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but I never memorized the good news, the next part and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. I'm going to memorize that, and I'm going to take myself out to lunch. So the next one says, (laughs) wait, was there another one? Maybe I skipped the next part of it. Go back one. Okay, so that's, that's, that's it. Oh, you're right. You were right. I was wrong. Yeah. This is the verdict. Now we're back to John, the original passage. So I gave you a little parenthesis that men are without excuse, condemned without Christ. Now we get back. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. What is that? Who's light? See, that's the other special revelation. General revelation is creation. Special revelation is God's word. And God's word. You get that? Jesus came into this world. Okay? No one denies the existence of Caesar. Everybody believes that Caesar lived. Do you know we have infinitely more proof that Jesus walked on earth than we do that Caesar walked on earth, and yet no one doubts Caesar? See, it's not a this issue. It's a this issue, which I'm going to show you in just, just a minute. Okay? Light has come into the world, but men loved what? darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Frank Turek, who I've been listening to, Ravi Zacharias, William Craig Lane, I've been listening to. uh, Frank Turek says, he'll ask students at college campuses, if I could prove to you that Christianity was true, would you become a Christian? And most of them say no. Because it's not about reason, it's not about proof. It's about that we love our dark ways, we love the darkness more than we love the light. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. 
I've told you this. You know, in 18 years, I've told you a lot. And sometimes I remember that I said it, sometimes I don't. But there are some things that I repeat because you need to get it. Here's John chapter 8. See, this is important when I do this. Here's John chapter 8. They bring out this adulterous woman to trick Jesus. You know the story. And so he writes in the, in the sand, whatever he writes, and they all fled one by one. And in the very next passage, I think it's John 8, 11, he says, I am the light of the world. And here's what, that, here's what this whole passage is. If you had a ply, piece of plywood in your backyard for the whole summer, rain, heat, and all of that, and you picked it up in September, all the grass is going to be dead, and there's going to be bugs living in there. And when those bugs are, are exposed to the light, what do they do? See that? Why did all the Pharisees? Because they were exposed to the light of the truth of Jesus Christ. See? And they fled. People love the darkness more than they love the light. Can you believe we live in days where there were things that we didn't even talk about? There were things that, like, we wouldn't even be able to conceive in our own minds. Now, not only are those things out in public, but they're glorified, and people take pride in their wickedness, in their wickedness. Now, we wouldn't use the same word pride, but can I just tell you this before I go any further? Shouldn't we be as enthusiastic about Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior? Shouldn't we stand up to against and in spite of, I should say, in spite of all persecution and all people calling us names and all, if those that live in wickedness are so proud of their lifestyle, shouldn't we be thankful, grateful, enthusiastic about Jesus who has set us free? And I am not calling for any type of hate, any type of, I'm so against all of that. Honestly, I love everyone. Uh, there's not a person that could come into this church, whatever their lifestyle was, that we wouldn't love them and welcome them and, and just let Jesus do a work in their life. We wouldn't pinpoint them, spotlight them, make fun of them. We would, I would never do that. Right. Never. But we have to stand up for truth. Can't we be enthusiastic about Jesus? See, that's my point. We, we look at them and we condemn them, but... Have we shined a light on our own heart? And are we as enthusiastic about Jesus as we should be considering all he's done for us? This is a question we need to have answered. This is a question we all have to, to deal with and reconcile. Everyone who does evil hates the light will not come into light for fear of his deeds that will be exposed. The unbeliever is lost for four reasons in our text. They have not believed. The light has come in Jesus. They love darkness more than light. They do not come to the light of Jesus. If you ever get into a question, maybe with a friend, a close friend, uh, a relative, and they begin to ask and they uh, criticize and are angry towards Christianity or whatever, if, if, you're, if your relationship can endure this, because watch, never carry the conversation beyond what your relationship can endure. Okay, now think about this. This is important. Never carry a conversation beyond what your relationship can endure because the same sun that melts the ice also hardens the clay. So if you don't have a relationship established enough with that person, you coming to them with the gospel will harden their heart even more because you don't have a relationship with them. But if you have a relationship with them, the gospel might very well soften the ice. Okay, now watch. Maybe the question to ask conversationally, lovingly, evaluate your own heart first, not to win an argument, but to give glory to the Lord. Ask that question. If I could show you that Christianity is true, would you believe? And that'll show right away where they're at in their heart. If they come out and say no, their heart is hard. You need to pray the Holy Spirit to work. If they say, yes, I would be interested in knowing more about it, then there's your opportunity to share the good news of the gospel. Do you understand what I'm saying? You still with me? Do you have about 15 more minutes or are you done? Okay. 20 more. Thanks. That makes one. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it, man. 
All right, so, so watch, watch. Here's the what. All people are lost. Here's the other what. This is the good news. Go to the next passage there. I see Beth quit. I'm sorry, John. I just wore her out up there. In the sixth month, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nat. Is that where he got his name? Oh, okay, because I was wondering about the angel stuff. Sorry, buddy, and I wasn't sure if that was, I'm just kidding. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Next. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Well, I mean, we would all think that. Uh, But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child, give birth to a son, you are to give him the name Jesus, he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, his kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked, since I am a virgin? Now we're getting into our main thought, the virgin birth. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Meaning what's impossible for you is possible with God. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the what? Holy. What's holy mean? What? Perfect, pure, without sin. The Holy One Will be, uh, to be born will be called the Son of God. Watch. All men are condemned. And we're condemned for a couple reasons because we're all children of Adam and his sin through natural childbirth is passed on to us. Okay? But secondly, at the earliest possible age, we've chosen to sin. So all of us are condemned. All of us are without excuse. So we needed someone that wasn't born or conceived the same way that we were conceived. Otherwise, he would be just as much a sinner as we are. And so God had a plan that the Holy Spirit would uh, overshadow Mary and she would conceive a son through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that son was not born into sin. That son was the Holy Spirit holy one without sin and he is the son of God and his name is Jesus. So if all men are condemned, what's the hope? Jesus. Why is he the hope? Is because he was born of a virgin without sin and he lived his whole life without sin. Therefore, he is the perfect uh, human to die in our place that his sacrifice would uh, be a substitute for us paying for our own sins. And since he was 100% God, not only was his sacrifice a substitute, but his sacrifice was sufficient to cover over all of our sins because he's God. See, we're all condemned. We're all without excuse. So we needed a savior, and that only, the only savior is Jesus. No one will be saved except calling upon the name of Jesus. That's why the virgin birth is so important. That's why if you're narrowing down the doctrines of Orthodox Christianity, you include in there that Jesus was born of a virgin. That makes him sinless. And again, his sacrifice was substitutionary and his sacrifice was sufficient because he was 100% man and 100% God. Do you understand? You understand the significance of that. That's why he is the holy one to be born. He was born holy. He lived holy. The question was asked, what about the innocent man in Africa? What about the innocent in South America, a tribesman? Someone said, as I was listening this week, if they were truly innocent, they would go to heaven. The problem with this question is, is there are no innocent people before a holy God. Now think about that. There are no innocent people before 
a holy God, for all have sinned, for none are righteous, no, not one. All are condemned by their own actions. And here it is. This is why we exist as a church. This is why Jesus established the church. This is why the Holy Spirit breathed life into the church on the day of Pentecost. We must share the gospel of Jesus Christ with everyone because everyone is lost without Jesus. Let me play this out logically. If everyone was not lost, and if someone could get to heaven by not hearing the gospel, if someone could get to heaven by not hearing the gospel, then what's the worst thing we could do for them? Share the gospel. Okay, let me catch you on this again. Ready? I'll move over here. Catch your attention back. If someone can go to heaven without hearing the gospel, okay, they could go to heaven without hearing the gospel. What's the worst thing we could ever do for them? Share the gospel. So we go to someone and we would tell them, oh, if, don't turn on the TV to a Christian station because if you hear the gospel, you will be condemned. No, you're, they're already condemned. Well, don't witness to someone. That's the worst thing you could do. for Before you witness to them, they were going to heaven. Do you see how ludicrous and ridiculous that is? But because there are none that are innocent, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope for all humanity. That's why we exist as a church. That's why as a denomination, the Assemblies of God, that's why we exist. Our, forefounder, our forefathers in the Assemblies of God declared that they wanted to be part of the greatest evangelization that the world has ever seen. And can I tell you just 100 years later that we are part of the greatest world evangelism that humanity has ever seen that the assemblies of God now, and that doesn't even mention other uh, Christian believing groups are in more countries than, than the UN, that in a little over 100 years, a little over 100 years, we have 600 million Pentecostal believers, and that number's probably greater than that even as I speak because God is pouring out his spirit in a great way. And you might think 100 years is a long time. Let me break it down for you like this, and I'm going to pick on the guys a little bit today. How long has your wife been asking you to do something? 100 years is not a long time in the big scheme of things. Why? Because God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Young men, young women, older men, older women. God is pouring out his spirit. Why is he doing it? Because all men are lost apart from Jesus Christ and we are responsible to share the message and the good news of Jesus Christ. Yes, your neighbor is condemned and lost without Jesus Christ. Yes, that person that lives in some other country and some where the gospel, ha yes, they are condemned without the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus said, go to every nation and make disciples. And here's the good news of all of that. If you go to Revelation, maybe chapter 7 is the first time that it mentions it. Even those that go to a difficult place, where the gospel has never been shared, we'd call them unreached people group. Even the missionaries that go there will reap some sort of harvest even amongst the unreached people. Now watch this, because in Revelation it says they will be gathered around the throne of God worshiping Jesus from every tribe and every nation and every people group. And that's why we believe in missions here and that's why we're missionaries where God has placed us because without Jesus Christ, people are lost. He has no plan B. He's not going to write the gospel in the sky. He sent his son from heaven to cross over into our time and in our place to die on the cross. He raised up a church of two billion people to share the good news of the gospel with those that have never heard before. He's placed you where you're working now to be a light to those that have never heard. You live in a neighborhood to be a light to those that have never heard. That's why we exist to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have no other purpose greater than sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that have never heard. That's a big so what. 
I told you the what, the so what is huge. Why does it matter? Because Bill, not just billions of people around the world that haven't heard, your neighborhood hasn't heard. They've heard what they think is the gospel, but they've never heard the gospel of grace. They've never seen it lived out. Live it out in your life. Think of ways to be a blessing to your neighborhood. Something. Walk up and down and just pray for each house and see what God, see what God is able to do. Don't start by going door to door. That turns more people off than it turns them on towards Christ. Again, the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. But if you begin with prayer for that person and they end up out in their front yard and they strike up a conversation, you might never know what God is able to do. But if you don't leave your house and you don't leave this church building, you'll never encounter people that need to know about Jesus Christ. Your highest calling in life is very simple, to live the life and to tell others about Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what your occupation is. You could be a wealthy businessman, but if you're not living for Jesus Christ, here's what it means. It means nothing. What are you going to present to God in heaven? You're going to say, wow, look at, my, look at my house. Look how big it is. Look how much money I have in the bank. Look at these cars that I own. God's going to say, we've got streets that people walk on that are made of gold. We're not real impressed with your earthly possessions up here. What's the mission of your life? What all are lost? Jesus is the only Savior. Without belief in Christ and turning to him, there is no salvation. So what? By believing, we are not condemned. Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. We're not condemned before Christ. I'm not preaching this with passion to condemn you. You're not condemned before Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation in, in him. I'm preaching it with passion to challenge you that because you are not condemned, because you are saved, therefore we must share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have eternal life. We know that as we pass from this life to the next, there is no depth because instantaneously to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Our place is established through belief in Jesus Christ. But don't we all know people whose place is not assured? If God just wanted us to go to heaven, and that was his only purpose, as soon as you accepted Christ, he would have killed you. He left you here because he has a reason and a purpose for you. So now what? What? So what? Now what? First of all, we must believe, all of us, because we are without excuse. We must commit our ways and our will to Jesus Christ. It's not just belief, mental assent. Yeah, I believe Jesus existed. I believe he walked. Uh, again, we've been through this a million times. The devil believes all that. It's about repentance and saying, God, I want to live for you want to live for you. Belief brings change. And you can believe in Jesus and never change. But if you believe in Jesus and repent and God that created the universe comes into your heart and life, you will change. And if God that created the universe and spoke it into existence lives in your heart, your neighbors will notice that there's something different about you. The people that you work with will notice that there's something different about you. We must, number two, now what? We must live for him and not ourselves. Every, mo every day, we must commit our lives to Jesus. I go to bed at night thinking, Lord, thank you for a good day. Thank you, Lord. And in a natural sense, not every day is good. But in God, every day is good. And I, I wake up every morning, every morning and say, God, use me. Simple as that. Use me in some way. 
to be a blessing, to encourage, to tell, to whatever. God, just, just use me today. That's all. That's my only purpose in life. I have no other purpose than to be used by God. Number three, we must tell others. There is no plan B for the salvation of the lost. He's not going to write it in the sky. When Jesus comes back the next time, it's too late. We're his plan A, the church of Jesus Christ. We have done as a church miraculously well in giving to missions. I don't have the final numbers, so don't share this yet. This is just a secret between us that are here today and those that are listening. But in the last 15 years, we have given, as a church, Malaga Assembly of God, over a million dollars to missions. Over a million. Okay? You can clap for that because that's pretty exciting. (laughs) Everything we have is paid for. We have no debt. Every reconstruction, building, everything is completely paid for. We pay our bills every week or month. Sometimes in the summer it gets a little iffy. But overall, and you know why? It's because we put the gospel of Jesus Christ first. Can I just ask you again? I'm going to just keep going just for another minute. Have any of you that have given to missions over a 15-year time period been without food to the point that you were starving and had to ask someone else for help? Have any of you that have given to the work of the Lord here at Malaga Assembly of God over the past 15 years ever been without clothes that you had to go and ask for help to get clothes? Have any of you that have given over a 15-year period of time ever been without uh, transportation, ever been without a home? Have you, have you really ever been with, without? Maybe you've chosen to be without because God put it on your heart to sacrifice something. But David said this, King David, I was young and now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. Now's not the time to stop. Now's not the time to lose the passion. Now's not the time to look and say, we've done so much, we've given so much, we need to focus on ourselves. We need to keep reaching the world with the gospel. But can I also tell you, we need to keep and maybe work even harder at reaching our neighborhood with the gospel. Because it's a lot easier to write a check and send someone else than it is to live for Jesus and invite your neighbor to church and find some way to bless them. Because you can write a check and send someone else and you don't face any uh, rejection. They face the rejection. Here you are. You go. But if that's our attitude, what the underlying attitude is, here you go so I don't have to go. I'm telling you today, you can't do that. You go and I'll go. You go there, I'll go here. You go with a passport, I'll live in my house, but I'll be a witness for Jesus Christ. That's it. Look, uh, I told you I was passionate about this because this is my whole purpose for existence, to tell people about Jesus and to make disciples that others can hear. I really don't see any other purpose. Raise my family in church, you know, prayerfully, you know, see them loving the Lord and growing in their relationship. To I mean, I don't know what else there is. Yeah, I have clothes and food and all that, but That's not my passion. My passion is Jesus Christ. And then, crazy how it works. When we make him our passion, the God of the universe actually can meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Something how that works. It also works the other way. When you don't have a passion for Jesus, you'll never have what you're looking for. It's just the way it works. All right, I'm going to close. Because I want to hear Dave sing again. 
Next time, come with a couple specials. That was my fault. All right? When are you coming again? All right, good. Thanks. This is on my desk. And it spins. It doesn't have a whole lot of light. It's solar. Uh, I'm covering up most of the light now. There it goes. And it sits right on my desk. And I see it every day. All day. My wife got me this a couple Christmases ago. And on it is this passage in Romans 10, 13 through 15. And I'll close with this. I'm just going to set it down. I'm going to set it on the table here. For everyone. And in the Greek, that means everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The what? We're lost. But Jesus is the answer. The so what? God has no plan B. The now what I must believe and I must tell others about Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.